Conferência poderemos estabelecer de uma maneira apropriada a nossa posição no universo. Obrigado. Aging results because of biotropy, 
that is, genes having multiple effects, positive at one age and negative at another age, and because of genes that have simply never been exposed to selection in the wild. And natural selection certainly can continue after reproduction via the well understood principle of kin selection. The missing question about medicine or evolution is why has natural selection left the body so vulnerable? Parts of the body are absolutely exquisite. The first two years of medical school leave you one with a sense of awe if one is paying attention at all. The body appears to be an exquisitely designed machine whose parts are exacting almost beyond comprehension. But then one moves to the clinic, and it seems like the body's design are a botched job. It's almost as if those wonderful engineers who did the first part of their job took off early for the week and left the job to quite substandard engineers who just didn't get it. The question is, why? The old answer is that natural selection is just too weak to make the bodily machine better. Flaws are inevitable because natural selection is a random process of limited power. Whether it's a Rube Goldberg contraction or a fancy sleek machine, nonetheless the flaws are attributed to the limits of natural selection. That explanation is absolutely correct. Natural selection has quite severe limits as to what it can accomplish and much disease results. However, there are five other good reasons and the rest of this lecture will outline all six possible reasons for why the body is vulnerable to disease. That is why natural selection hasn't been able to do a better job. George Williams and I began working together in the late 1980s trying to figure out how evolution could be made more useful to medicine. We were brought together by our initial shared interest in evolution and aging, asking ourselves the question of why natural selection had arranged for organisms to live much longer in a much healthier state. Eventually, we published an article somewhat grandly titled The Dawn of Darwinian Medicine, the key to which was asking new questions about why disease exists. This is a picture of George Williams standing behind John Maynard Smith and Harris Mayer as they're together in Stockholm to receive the Crawford Prize, which is a Nobel Prize for evolutionary biologists. When George and I began working together, our initial question was how natural selection shaped disease. But after a few months, we realized that this was the wrong question. The right question is, how did natural selection shape vulnerability to disease? We were quite excited to discover that natural selection can help explain maladaptations as well as adaptations. It can help explain why the body isn't better. The eye offers a wonderful example, often it seems as the exemplar of perfection, everything perfect. However, it's also the exemplar of selection's limits. In the first half of medical school, you recognize that the only clear tissue in the body is there right where it needs to be in the front of the cornea. There's a lens that's flexible so that the eye can focus from near to far, and tiny, tiny hair-like fibers <coughs> that help squeeze it in just the right way at just the right time. There's an iris that expands and contracts so that it more or less light, and even the eyelid itself is a marvel of design, shutting quickly when anything approaches rapidly, and tears like, steadily coat the surface of the eye flowing from the outer edge to the inner edge to constantly keep it clean. But then, after learning about all of these apparent perfections, medical students get to the clinic. What do they see there? Glaucoma, cataracts, myopia, presbyopia, iritis, the cornea becomes clouded, the retina detaches. Who would design this thing anyway? For that. So, how is evolution useful for medicine? In several areas, the contribution is very well established. Antibiotic resistance is studied always with an evolutionary perspective. Genetics is increasingly studied with an explicitly evolutionary perspective, although it's always been grounded in evolution, at least since the 1940s. And physiology has long asked questions about the functions of traits in addition to how they work. In other areas of medicine, however, much remains to be done. In particular, many new research questions need to be asked once you take an evolutionary perspective. And most important of all, is the feeling for the organism that you get when you study it as a bundle of trade-offs shaped by natural selection. So many researchers and physicians have as their analogy a machine. They think of the body as a machine.